husband Noah recently subscribed to Wired magazine. It's a magazine that focuses on technology and its impact on culture and politics. I don't read it, it's not my thing. It comes in the mail, I stick it on the entryway table and I forget about it. Except for the most recent issue, which is haunting me. It's haunting me. The cover reads, there's a one in 10 chance an invisible waterfall will destroy the world. Do you like those odds? No. No, Wired Magazine, I do not like those odds. I think about the invisible waterfall every day. I brush my teeth and I wonder if a torrential onslaught might break forth above me. I wash the dishes and consider what an invisible waterfall even is. I walk past the entryway table and I wonder why Wired Magazine is trying to ruin my life. I finally read the article yesterday. It's been sitting there for over a month. I finally read it yesterday. In case you were wondering, the invisible waterfall is actually this current system, the main current system in the Atlantic Ocean. This current system is being impacted by climate change. And if this current slows or stops, it could radically alter our weather patterns, putting our global food system at risk. So, since yesterday, I've stopped worrying about a Noah's Ark type event, and I've added invisible waterfall to my larger box of climate-related anxieties. I worry about the future. I come from a great line of worriers. This is a side note, but when I was writing this sermon, Google Docs kept trying to auto-correct worriers to warriors. No, Google, I don't come from a great line of warriors. I come from a great line of worriers. My Papa Bill famously gave everyone disaster preparedness gifts for Christmas. Weather radios, safety flares, vests, crank charge, flashlights. As a kid, I thought this was ridiculous, but now I kind of get it. We worry about the future, some of us more than others, but we worry about the precarity of life for ourselves and future generations. Abram is worried about the future. He and his wife, Sarai, have no biological children. This means that they don't have someone appointed to care for them in their elder years, and they have no one to whom they can entrust their property, their wealth. God did promise Abram an heir, but that was way back in chapter 12. Abram hasn't had it easy since then, as Georgia was sharing before she read this scripture. Abram left his home, traveled through Egypt, rescued his nephew Lot from captivity, and still, all this time later, there is no child. Abram's getting worried. Life has not gone as Abram and Sarai hoped. They've struggled with fertility, something they share with one in six people globally today. It's a painful struggle. It's one that's not often talked about openly, even now, and rarely from the pulpit. Yet so many people, so many people know the particular anxiety and grief of this, the longing for a child, and the challenges, the 
complications, losses that can arise. So many people that need not be ashamed or given more hurdles, but listened to with compassion and trusted to make their own decisions and given access to care. I always wonder what didn't make it into the text for this scripture or any scripture. I wonder what didn't make it in. We aren't told how long exactly Abram and Sarah have been trying to conceive. We aren't told the intricacies of how they were treated by others in their community. We aren't told if Sarai has miscarried. We can, however, be sure that Abram and Sarai know what it is to mourn that which hasn't happened, that which hasn't gone as hoped. I think we can all relate to this on some level. Maybe it's grief about the ending of a job, career that didn't go a certain way, or maybe the ending of a relationship. Maybe it is anxiety about the viability of one's financial future, wondering whether you can afford a house or a car or retirement. We all carry grief of the past and anxiety of the future because we know the precarity of our human lives. So does God. God knows because God listens. God doesn't dismiss Abram's doubt or anxiety, but rather counsels him in the midst of it. God tells him, fear not. This is the, the first time those words are written in scripture, and certainly not the last. Fear not. Instructions I've always had some trouble following. Fear not. I am your shield. You are not alone. I see you. And then God takes things in a radical direction. God brings Abram outside to look up at the stars. And he doubles down on the promise. God says that not only will Abram have descendants, Abram will have more than he could possibly count. This is a beautiful image, isn't it? It's also a little bit absurd. Abram is worried about having one heir. One. And God says there will be billions. <laughs> it's like asking for an apple and getting an orchard. Or asking for a glass of water and getting all of Lake Michigan. The scale of this is extravagant. This tells us something about the vision of God. God works in bulk. God works in abundance. God wants absurdly, abundantly, extravagantly good things for her people. This is the covenant. A relationship between God and Abram where they work together toward abundant goodness. God promises to be present with Abram and Sarai, and Abram promises to trust, or at least to try. We, too, are part of this covenant. We, too, are invited to work with God. We, too, are invited to trust, to trust that with God, radical goodness is possible. Now, this covenant with God, it's an active thing. Today's selection from the Gospel of Luke can help us understand 
covenant further. Here, John the Baptist preaches a message of justice and equity. He reminds the crowd that the covenant with God isn't a one and done. It's not a hall pass through life. It's a collaborative relationship in which both God and humanity participate. God is present in the lives of the people, and the people are asked to bear good fruit. John gets pretty specific about what that means. He gives three groups advice based on their distinct context. To the crowds, which presumably included those with at least moderate means, he says they must provide for others out of their excess. To the tax collectors, who could be quite corrupt in their work, John says they must be fair. And to the soldiers who were often tempted by violence and greed, John says they must be content with their given wages and must use their power appropriately. Provide for others out of your excess. Be fair and uncorrupt. Beware violence and greed. John reminds them that God's justice isn't deterred by the privileges of race, wealth, or social status. He calls them back to their covenantal values. John isn't necessarily telling them something they don't know or have never heard before. He's calling them back. Come back to what you know. Come back to your covenantal values. He's calling them back to trust and participation in God's radical goodness for all. You see, there is a fullness, a fullness to life with God. It's like the hymn says, for the love of God is broader than the measures of the mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. God's love is is like the stars in the sky, It's more than we can count. It's more than we can even sometimes imagine. The covenant asks us to trust that together with God, something wonderful can happen. That doesn't mean that life will go as we expect. I wish I could tell you otherwise. Just sign up for the covenant and you'll never be anxious again. Or, you know, as the song says, it means no worries for the rest of your days. (laughs) Abram and Sarai's story, it shows us something different than a Disney movie. Their journey has all sorts of ups and downs. They do have children. But the way that they go about it creates harm and some family division. Their covenant with God erases neither grief nor anxiety, nor does it guard them from their own mistakes. But their lives are full. Their lives have goodness. Their lives involve a love more expansive than they could imagine or accomplish on their own. Let's use our own biblical imaginations for a second. That's part of why we read scripture, to grow our biblical imagination, to see where the ancient story intersects with our own. So let's use our biblical imaginations. Where In your life, have you seen the covenantal relationship at work? When have you trusted God? When have you collaborated with others? When have you seen something wonderful, even absurdly wonderful, occur? 
I think about the earliest days of the pandemic, right after lockdown. I was scared. I felt really lonely and anxious and unsure of the future. And I remember Palm Sunday of that year. I can say confidently it was unlike any other Palm Sunday that this church has had in its 150 years. Because we were on Zoom. Some of you maybe remember it. We, we logged on and we were all in our little squares and because we didn't have palms, we waved our house plants around. <laughs> Kathy, I particularly remember you and your house plant. <laughs> I know this is maybe a small example. It didn't make a difference on a global scale, but it made a difference for me. And I hope for some of you. On that Sunday, I didn't feel alone. And I didn't feel scared. It was more wonderful than anything I could have done by myself. When we trust God, and when we act out of that trust, wonderful things can happen. Wonderfully, extravagantly good things can happen. I don't know what to do about the invisible waterfall or about any of the climate disasters that are at hand. And realistically, I don't foresee myself becoming less anxious about them. I do, however, know that odds are we can do more with God and with each other than we could possibly do on our own. And those odds? Those I like. Amen. Amen.